British Safety Council. Training work engagement in remote hybrid work. Before we start the webinar, we're just going to play video while all the attendees. This is going to take a couple of safety around well being, uh, and we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Interested in the well-being of your organization? Do you find it difficult to know where to start or how your existing well-being offering is working? We have worked with experts to create holistic well-being solutions suitable for organizations at any stage, including our unique Being Well Together program, the integrated solution for all your health, safety, and well-being needs. Our research indicates that only 49% of companies have a written well-being strategy and most of those do not measure effectiveness. Our range of solutions help you to identify gaps in well-being provision, providing clear guidance on how you can address them. Becoming a supporter of the Being Well Together program means access to tools and resources, allowing you to effectively develop and implement a health, safety and well-being strategy in a joined up holistic way. You will see the health and well-being of your workforce improve and make the most of your investments. The Being Well Together program is available from British Safety Council or Mates in Mind, both registered charities. is equipped with 22 years of experience in HR training and education as lead consultant with our countries, India, Singapore and the United Kingdom, and has worked with managers from various sectors, education and finance. Rupa is a joint council, Marcus Hurt who will give a short introduction before we head to the main. Um, so welcome on board, Rupa. Marcus. Great, thanks, David. And uh, I'm not sure if it's my Wi-Fi um, or yours, but it was uh, it was cutting in and out a little bit um, during the introduction. So um, hopefully it is just uh, David's Wi-Fi and uh, it's uh, not, not, a, not all of us. Um, but yeah, David, thanks for the uh, intro um, and welcoming Rupa as well, our um, guest speaker. And today, obviously, Rupa is an expert in her own area. Um, and we've invited Rupa to talk on this particular subject as part of our webinar series of 2023, um, because it's one of the areas at the moment that organizations are highlighting as being a particular area of challenge for them and something that they want to know more information about. Um, and so, of course, as you saw from the introduction uh, video, um, and for anybody who has attended our previous webinars um, or currently works with us within British Safety Council or Mates in Mind, um, we'll know that we are essentially in a business of identifying the known and unknown needs and issues via our assessment services, our consultancy and our auditing, so that we can then actually put together, create and deliver informed solutions through our education, consultancy and Being Well Together programme. So um, today, with, I'm not going to take any more of the limelight. I'm going to be handing over to Rupa to get stuck into the, the meat of the session. And uh, I'll be joining back at the end for the Q&A. So Rupa, thanks very much. Um, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Marcus and uh, David. I'm, hope, I'm hoping you can all hear me clearly. Yes, loud and clear, Rupa. OK, in that case, I'll get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rupa Nagori. I'm the lead consultant at RN HR Consultants and an academic and researcher at Coventry University. And I'm here today to share my research on a topic that's very close to my heart, employee engagement and well-being. Uh, but what I'm really trying to research is how, uh, you know, this is working in remote hybrid work. What are the factors that influence well-being in hybrid work? 
So uh, this is the focus of my research, key factors influencing employee engagement and well-being uh, in hybrid work. And um, I've uh, finished a systematic literature review um, and I'm hoping to write an article that would recommend to practice a practical framework to improve engagement and well-being uh, at current times. So uh, why I got interested in this research was uh, especially because as hybrid work has evolved and employees demand greater flexibility, research has shown that uh, remote work causes work intensification but also blurring of work-life boundaries. I'll be explaining these terms a bit more in detail soon. So careful design of work is required by organizations so uh, we don't lose the motivation and productivity in hybrid workers. So these are the key challenges. Um, the pandemic had an uh, unprecedented impact on the job demands of remote workers and employers and employees were forced to make changes overnight. For example, in higher education itself, we had to teach uh, you know, online suddenly and we had to move all our lectures online. So for uh, you know, um, lecturers who were not uh, familiar with digital technologies, it placed huge demands on what they had to learn overnight. Um, and hence now, employees demand more flexibility, inclusion, and well-being support. Um, at this point, I'd like to share a very interesting piece of research by the Engage for Success movement, it, uh, in which I've been involved for more, about eight years now. Uh, we work with organizations to identify how employee engagement can be improved. And I, I think in the UK, we were doing quite well before the pandemic, but uh, what happened during the pandemic is engagement levels fell drastically. And this could be because um, of a lot of, a lot of workload and stress because of technology, uh, popularly known, now known as techno stress. So a lot of technology related demands, blurring of work life boundaries, and that seemed to bring down employee engagement levels in the UK. Um, after the pandemic, employee engagement has recovered, but not to the full extent. So if you look at the statistics today, engagement is still lower as compared to pre-pandemic levels. And this is the main focus of my research. What can we do to bring up levels of employee engagement and well-being in staff. Um, so um, I'm not going to go into too much details uh, about my research methodology, but uh, why I want to discuss this is just um, to explain the credibility behind all the findings that I'm sharing with you. So I undertook a systematic literature review using the PRISMA technique, which is a very popular method used in academics. And an initial literature review revealed the kind of stresses that employees were talking about today. They were talking about job demands, job resources, also technology and the stress created due to technology, but also things like work intensification. And I think this was primarily because um, what happened in remote work is the work-life boundaries just got blurred and employees didn't realize that work was eating into their personal or family time. And um, a, a number of articles uh, uh, revealed that, uh, you know, techno stress, for example, was a key concern that uh, employees as well as employees were talking about. And, um, you know, uh, in terms of high job demands, well being support took a lot of significance. So um, there are a key frameworks that came up in my research which relate to employee engagement and well-being. I think one of the um, you know, oldest and most widely used frameworks in academics is the Job Demands Resources Framework, which uh, talks about the various job demands uh, that create stress for employees. And uh, the job resources and personal resources that 
employers can provide to overcome these job demands to improve work engagement and performance for employees. What's um, in, uh, interesting about this framework is this framework also offers um, a tool to measure well-being and engagement and it does so by measuring three factors uh, the vigor of your employees their dedication and absorption so there is a questionnaire designed around these three dimensions that can help employers measure well-being at work um, so the key idea now is is this framework still relevant because employees as well as employers are talking about work intensification due to techno stress and digital demands. Uh, so what I'm hoping to do is look at these frameworks and see how they can be made more relevant for practice. Uh, the other framework that is uh, really key and has been discussed a lot in academia is the ASSET framework by Robertson and Cooper. They discuss the key workplace factors that influence well-being at work and these are these are the factors that we have been working with over the years things like communication autonomy work-life balance job security and change but as well as the work relationships uh, you know that can build psychological safety and uh, the confidence to do your work uh, job conditions so in job conditions in particular, uh, the design of job and how technology and the digital component can be balanced is what is significance today. And hence, uh, there is a new term now that we're talking about a lot in academics when we talk about mental well-being and digital work, and that's uh, digital well-being. How do we take care of the digital well-being of an employee to ensure that uh, there's no technological overload and um, there's, um, there's uh, not too much work intensification in employees. Um, and, um, you know, so this, this would be the focus of uh, my discussion today. Um, in addition, um, a lot of articles revealed that uh, the causes of stressors have changed. Workload still remains as the number one stressor, but then you also have the um, non-work factors such as relationships and family. And this is where, um, I think this is what's different with digital or hybrid work is, um, you know, how do you balance those boundaries between your work and family? Uh, the other st stressor that stood out was COVID-related anxiety, um, which, um, you know, organizations have been tackling well. Uh, and um, then <clears throat> uh, poor work-life balance, surprisingly, has now, um, you know, taken a backseat because remote hybrid work does improve your work-life balance, and that has shown to improve productivity. So this is an interesting piece of research from uh, CIPD that I thought, uh, you know, um, I would share with you today. And CIPD published this in the Health and Wellbeing at Work report. And it uh, brings out how work-life balance and flexibility is something that needs to be managed carefully. So uh, the shift to remote or hybrid work has brought about mental health issues, and that's why this growing significance of well-being. I think I'd like to give you again an example from the higher education sector here, yeah, because I have been interviewing a lot of staff um, on uh, what what has been happening with their well-being during the pandemic and after, and um, you know, in particular. Uh, one lecturer uh, particularly spoke about the work intensification caused due to the always-on culture that influences work-life balance. It becomes difficult when you're working remotely or in a hybrid uh, manner to switch off uh, because uh, you know of the demands on time. And hence, this is something that employers should be aware of. In a survey conducted by Engage for Success, um, there were some interesting uh, uh, findings uh, which uh, 
again, um, you know, I would like to share with you um, the current job demands that were highlighted in this report were techno stress. So, as I said, techno stress is particularly a um, new feature that, you know, is coming up and it's causing work intensification. But also, remote work causes professional isolation and blurring of work life boundaries. And hence, um, uh, the messenger to employers are uh, uh, to provide job resources that could support the remote worker, especially capabilities to deal with new technologies. So, um, techno stress is avoided. Again, in uh, my example from the higher education sector, the particular lecturer uh, felt overwhelmed by all the new technologies that. Uh, had to be adopted overnight and hence um, has resigned. So when I asked uh, the lecturer as to why um, the resignation and why she decided to leave the industry, it was because um, uh, well-being support, although it was uh, down there as a policy and she knew where to see it on the internet, but she didn't know really what to do about it who to approach and how to uh, leverage on that well-being support to overcome the uh, techno stress or work intensification. And uh, so I th this is um, how I'd like to summarize my research. I think the key challenges that employers face today, uh, especially when it comes to the well-being of uh, workers, um, working in remote or hybrid jobs is that they, they, they do feel the professional isolation. And this could be because, uh, uh, you know, they're socially cut off from the rest of the team. Uh, they do feel that there's too much technology being thrown at them. Uh, so employers need to think about how this can be managed um, and uh, put support mechanisms in place. Uh, there are blurring of work-life boundaries um, caused due to the always-on culture. And uh, we need to, again, think about how uh, this can be managed and um, employees can be given, they can be, be equipped with mechanisms to manage this. So the opportunities for employers are to put in place the right training and support for technology. I think that's required, especially um, you know, if you're introducing new technology, structured or daily check-ins for quick collaboration. Uh, this is to prevent the professional isolation that employees may be experiencing in hybrid work. Um, you know, even if it's a quick coffee with someone from the department or a check-in where your manager can see you on camera and see you're okay, uh, I think that would go a long way in preventing the professional isolation. And then there are some well-being strategies that uh, I'm going to discuss shortly with you that employers uh, can um, put in place. And uh, Marcus also spoke about the Being Wealth program, uh, which he will speak about later. So um, uh, what are the implications for practice? Um, so remote and hybrid work does improve productivity because um, uh, research has shown, um, you know, that it does not hinder productivity in any way. However, what employers should be aware of is the work intensification that it may be causing. Um, so it's crucial that organizations take uh, a number of steps to have a well-being strategy in place. Um, a recent um, uh, piece of research confirmed that uh, having a well-being strategy in place would benefit uh, both the employer and the employee. Um, and that is because employees would get a better work-life balance. It would help their stress levels. It would improve their morale and work engagement. But also it would lower sickness absence and improved productivity. So um, the key recommendations for practice, um, a few high impact practices that uh, we have seen organizations implement is um, 
improve the employee experience, map the employee journey and the various pressure points so that you can personalize your well-being uh, initiatives and employee engagement initiatives. Uh, source regular employee feedback. So learn from employee feedback in a way that improves the employee experience. At the end, end of the day, before you design your well-being strategy, uh, you must ensure that it's taken into consideration all the needs um, of that your employees have. Um, also, because uh, specifically nowadays, you have so many tools, you have various apps, um, and you have various um, other devices to track employee well-being. Uh, so it's very essential to collect your employee feedback and determine what your employees need uh, that would improve their employee journey. Um, as I also said, we need to address techno stress, provide resources to help people improve their digital well-being. Uh, especially to deal with technology overload or techno stress as it's known and also improve communication so i spoke earlier about st having structured check-ins with your staff these could be face to face or using communication technology um, it could be even in the form of forums where your employees are collaborating and it could that could be on teams or using some other communication software and this can prevent social isolation um i i also thought that i'll share with you the case study of a consulting uh, assignment that i um, did last year um, i was approached by a healthcare organization which has uh, business in a number of locations and they had um, the typical HR issues of high absence and high turnover, low productivity had started to return after the pandemic. And uh, so what we did with them was a bit of an employee journey mapping exercise, as you can see on the slides, where um, we uh, map the experiences of employees at every stage in terms of uh, uh, you know, what What were the pressure points, uh, where were they feeling the pressure and, uh, you know, what well-being interventions could be introduced at each point in the employee journey. Once the mapping was done, we personalized uh, the journey maps to uh, various segments of uh, employees and uh, recommended interventions to improve employee engagement and well-being and um, uh, gathered uh, feedback and metrics. So um, I think this, this was a very successful ex uh, exercise for the uh, organization. We yet have to see long-term results, but in the short term, uh, what the business has uh, shared with me is that it's health absence levels and it's um, helped uh, employee turnover in the short run. So um, there, you know, you if if you do want to adopt the employee journey mapping approach, there are six steps um, in which you can map, um, you know, the employee life cycle and what's happening at each stage of the life cycle in terms of employee engagement and well-being. One um, recommendation would be uh, don't have too many different surveys in the organization try and consolidate them so you're um, looking at um, you know specific measurements that combine engagement measures well-being measures experience measures and you're um, you know collecting feedback in an integrated way from your employees um uh, yeah and this this is um my final slide that um, i want uh, to share with you today and it's about again um, the CIPD health and well-being at work um, survey which spoke about uh, various methods that employers are using today to identify and reduce stress in the workplace um, and I know um, some of you may be already using these methods so I'm very interested in finding out later in the chat 
um, or through uh, the open forum as to which methods you're using and are you doing something in addition to these uh, methods that you see on screen? Uh, any examples of good practice and evidence to support uh, the good practice that you're following? So uh, we'll have a quick look um, at the various mechanisms that organizations are adopting today. So you have employee assistant programs, and these seem to be the most popular. Um, especially, you can see how they have uh, grown in popularity after the pandemic. Then you have um, improved work-life balance. Um, it's true that we were kind of, um, you know, uh, really kind of thinking about this during the pandemic, and we were encouraged to take these steps uh, during the pandemic. But I think it's really improved after the pandemic as well. You see improved work-life balance has uh, benefited employers and employees. Uh, but also staff surveys have been growing in popularity. Staff surveys, uh, particularly to find out what causes stress and uh, what organizations should be doing about it. Uh, then your risk assessments uh, and stress audits, which are required by law, but also it's a good practice to uh, communicate the results to your employees and involve them in how um, stress can be reduced at work. Training for line managers is key. Um, and I think um, uh, that can have a significant impact on the well-being of your staff. Uh, training aimed at building, um, you know, resilience in staff, such as coping techniques, mindfulness, are also gaining popularity. But the biggest recommendation here is do your employees know that these methods are available and do they know where to find the help and approach the right person when they need them? So um, I think the communication here is key when you try and implement these methods. Um, involvement of occupational health specialists would uh, be very helpful here as well, as well as stress management training for the whole workforce. And um, I think the stress policy and guidance is something that most organizations have been following. But uh, I think we really need to think about how we can um, have this at a more strategic level as an employee well-being strategy. Right, so um, I think um, uh, uh, Marcus will be coming in to share a bit more about the uh, Being Well Together program. But I'd just like to end by saying uh, that there is real benefit, especially for our remote and hybrid work workforce in undertaking um, well-being at a strategic level and um, you know, approaching organizations such as the British Safety Council. Um, I was reviewing the website of the British Safety Council and I could see that uh, the Being Well Together program has uh, already got uh, evidence of success um, where there is evidence of uh, employees, uh, you know, uh, increasing uh, the amount of exercise they do, increasing um, the involvement and engagement at work in terms of reduced absence, uh, but also uh, support uh, when it comes to smoking and reduction of alcohol consumption. So at this point then, I would uh, just share my references with you as to where the information is from, and then hand over to Marcus, who will give you more details of the Being Well Together program. Um, thank you, everyone. Yeah, Rupert, thank you uh, so much um, for going through you know, that particular topic and also sharing some of your research methodology. Really, really interesting stuff. Um, and uh, of course, you know, as part of our 2023 webinar series, and um, for anybody that's attended this uh, webinar, which has been a particularly popular one, um, you are able to access a 30 minute uh, complimentary consultation with one of our wellbeing team members. Um, if you are interested in doing that and to identify whether or not there's any needs that we can actually support you with, 
If you've got a smartphone that has a QR scanner on it, you can open that up now and you can just scan the QR code that's on your screen. Um, and then that will take you to a form to fill out and you can just complete the details and then we will be in touch. Um, if you don't have one of those scanners on your phone, um, you can also just send us an email uh, to the email address that's on the screen. Um, or of course, give us a call and just let us know that you attended uh, Rupa's webinar today um, so that we can then organize the complimentary consultation. Um, and shortly we'll be moving into the Q&A uh, part of the webinar. And um, so we'll, uh, in a moment, we'll be inviting our events team back into the, into the call to share some of those Q&A. Uh, but I, before we do that, I just wanted to share a couple of comments as well with you, Rupa, um, just around you know, some of the things that you've covered there, I think, uh, actually really interesting in that the things that have come out of recent conversations we've been having as well with um, some of our existing supporters. Uh, we hosted one of our roundtable events recently for our Being Well Together supporters. And one of the kind of key themes that came out of that really was communication. And um, you've highlighted, you know, through a number of points within your presentation that communication actually has by itself an impact on the, the amount of techno stress. Um, and for this one particular supporter, what they found was that when they were getting the views of the employees, they were finding that the organization itself was communicating, but in too many ways. So they found that, you know, the emails, the WhatsApp groups, the intranet pages, the Slack messages, all these kind of different ways that this organization was communicating um, actually was information overload. So it wasn't that they weren't communicating enough. It was that they were communicating almost too much. Um, is that something that you've come across within any of your literature review where um, either employees or companies are reporting that there's been too much communication as opposed to not enough? Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. I think, um, and that's been the key reason for work intensification in um, staff, uh, because um, also because they're working away from the office. Uh, they, uh, you know, staff really want to be involved and not miss out on any communication. So they tend to kind of uh, spend too much time looking at their gadgets and, um, you know, trying to. Um, you know, answer everything on the same day, which uh, which is what is causing the always on culture. So there was a lot of discussion also in the CIPD applied research conference uh, on this, you know, how the always on culture can be managed better by employers. Mm, yeah, and I, I think another thing as well, I'll just, it's just one more comment and then we'll hand over uh, to the Q&A uh, session so people can have their questions reviewed. Um, the other thing that I thought was quite interesting was that uh, that lecturer that you spoke about that, you know, unfortunately decided to resign um, because of the techno stress, you know, that, that was presented to them. And the, one of the primary reasons you mentioned was that it was the not knowing where and how to get support, which ultimately led them to feel like they didn't know, um, you know, how to deal with the increase in use of technology. Um, right. And I think it's, it, it's, I think it's probably going to be an area that isn't going to be easily solved in that if techno stress is having an impact on the levels of engagement in remote workers and the, one of the key factors for these remote workers or you know hybrid workers that are sometimes away from work um, if one of the issues or blockers for them is not knowing where and how to get support then that's going to be something that could be quite difficult to address because one of the ways in which you provide guidance or support to them is through some form of remote technology um, or training um, or support. So in those kind of instances where the solution potentially is part of the reason for the stressor, is there anything that you would recommend organizations that are currently dealing with the hybrid workforce and the challenges that that presents? Uh, yes, um, I think I do agree that we do need the technology and um, it's extremely helpful in providing us tools to uh, support employees. Uh, but I think um, if employees would prefer to speak to a person and see someone face to face, there should be alternatives. Um, mm. It doesn't mean that you've got to employ a lot of staff again to be on site and see someone face to face. It could be that you give them two hours in a day where you can drop in somewhere and probably get, uh, you know, help with something that you need. So I think, again, we, ev uh, you know, the support could also be available in a hybrid way rather than just being available online is mm. uh, what I would recommend. Yeah. 
Yeah, couldn't agree more. Thanks, Rupert. So um, if you'd like to just uh, transition to the final slide, um, and now I'll invite David um, to come back to the call. And we can sure. find out um, what kind of queue questions have been sent through via the chat function. Yes, thanks, Marcus. Um, first of all, apologies for any of the, uh, the technical issues that uh, we seem to have at the beginning of the presentation. Um, just doing some quick research on it, it appears to be caused by the, the volume of people who are joining the call some audio interference but uh, hopefully that's all resolved now <clears throat> so let's move to the the, the q a um lots of questions coming um, let's start with this one uh, for you rupa do you think demographics of staff has an effect on how we engage them if so what do you think is the best way to engage younger workers with older workers and that's from joe sains from um, british safety council Yes, I, I really think, um, um, you know, different uh, generations want different things out of the employer. And hence, um, you know, um, in practice, when I help organizations map the employee life cycle or the employee journey, I would always ask them to segment the um, workforce into various categories. And very often it 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 could be on demographics as to you know which generation for example if uh, we have staff uh, coming in on a graduate trainee program they probably do want to come into the office more because they've just started work and they um, want to meet people and they don't want to be sitting on a desk uh, uh, remotely and doing their work so um, I do think demographics would uh, be a very important factor in how you map your employee journey and the employee life cycle uh, touch points would be key here. Okay, great. Um, another question here we have from Rachel Phillips. How can you improve the the office when employees come into the office employees to want to engage or do not want to participate in engaging activities when arranged when they are in the office um, yeah I see that uh, happening uh, that's not new I think this is uh, much before uh, the pandemic as well and it's a problem that's con continued after in remote and hybrid work as well so um, um, I guess um, recognizing everyone's strengths and giving them roles to come out and display the strengths would be key here. And this is something we use very often in higher education, especially, you know, as lecturers teaching online, it was uh, quite disappointing to speak to a blank uh, screen where you couldn't see any faces. And uh, what we decided is to give specific activities to uh, students to come out and present in the subsequent sem seminars. But then this would be based on their interests and you know where they see themselves as experts. So um, kind of uh, understand what the mastery or the skills of each of your staff are, and then bring them out you know in leadership roles. And I think that really helps engagement. Excellent. Thanks, Rupa. Um, another question we have is, um, in my organization, people don't like to put their cameras on. This makes engagement difficult. How would you recommend we overcome this? Yeah, I think that seems to be quite a consistent problem across all industries. I thought that was a problem we had in higher education with students. Um, but um, I think um, also, you know, kind of just putting pressure on them and put on your cameras now is not uh, the right thing to do. Um, but um, again, you know, as I said, uh, find out what their strengths and interests are and where their passions uh, are and uh, pull them up in leadership positions to come and present something occasionally or, um, you know, uh, at the end of the day, if it's like a one-to-one -one conversation uh, uh, between um, uh, colleagues or a line manager and an employee, you might want to highlight that it's important for the line manager to see that uh, the team member is uh, doing well and they're okay. And hence, uh, you know, we do need to have the cameras on 
and that would lead to a better conversation. Excellent. Here's a great question for you, Rupa. I would like to collect employee feedback, but I don't know the best way to do this, nor do I have time to research to find out. Can the well Being Well Together program help me to collect employee feedback? This is a question from, from Jane. Uh, well, I think I'd pass this on to Marcus. Um, uh, because yeah, I, I, I can't believe that. Um, yeah, so it, it's quite, what's quite interesting about the timing of that question is that I was actually thinking as Rupert was talking that um, it's, it's really important that we don't actually make assumptions that people just choose not to put their webcam on. Um, it could actually be genuinely that they don't know how to functionally use a webcam um, or that they don't realize their webcam isn't on where they haven't selected to show their webcam. Um, I've, I've been in meetings myself with uh, other organizations um, where in some cases they just didn't select their webcam because of the uh, glitches that it would create within the calls, i.e. if they selected their webcam, then their webcam would also then become their audio source and therefore their microphone wouldn't pick up them speaking. Um, so I was actually thinking rather than making the assumption that people don't want to turn their webcams on, if you understand the employee's views um, and where their challenges potentially are, that you, you can and create support that's relevant to what their need is. Um, and of course, if it is, they just don't want to turn their camera on, then that's a whole other can of worms. Um, but yeah, to, to come back to the question that was just submitted, uh, yes, with, within the Being Well Together programme, we have both an employee wellbeing survey, um, and we also have a uh, organisation assessment tool. And so those two data sets can, can, can produce information to understand where the potential needs are within the organisation. But we also do a comparison between those two data sets. So you can understand then where the gaps are between the perceptions of the organization and then the perceptions of the employees. And I think you would have seen that came up as a bit of a theme throughout Rupa's uh, presentation, that when you address the gap between the perceptions of those two groups, that's when you can really put together a strategy that results in positive outcomes. And um, so, yeah, the, the short answer to that question is yes, it does. Excellent. Thanks, Marcus. Um, here's a question from Terence Considine. Um, he asks, from the metric you showed, there seem to be a surge of all initiatives in 2021, but these have dropped off in 2022. Also, the HSE management standards is the least popular initiative. Why do you think the drop in applications in 2022 happened and the low uptake of the HSE management standards happened in 2022? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Um, I think uh, remote work forced organizations to think a lot about employee engagement and well-being and hence there was a surge. Now whether that was an artificial surge created because of the pandemic uh, uh, is um, you know is what is to be investigated. Um, and so so if it's an artificial surge the drop is obvious uh, you know people are going to then give less priority to well-being and look at other initiatives i think people really started focusing on the bottom line of the business in 2022 and hence unfortunately mental health well-being um, employee engagement is seeing um, you know uh, less of a place in the uh, business strategy uh, which is why we are here um, today, you know, explaining why it's important and how it would benefit the business and improve uh, key metrics in an organization. Can I, I just add uh, on that as well, David? So, um, yeah, it is interesting. If you look at uh, across the board, actually, not just in the HSC management standards, but also wellbeing support, um, employee perceptions of whether or not their organization and their line managers are investing in uh, wellbeing as well. Unfortunately, yeah, there has been a dip in 2022 in comparison to the previous year. And I, I do, you know, you quite easily make the assumption that the pandemic did shine a positive lens on the need for wellbeing support. Um, but unfortunately, wellbeing is often an area where the budget will be cut as a first point of call. Um, but usually that will be done without the understanding of the positive outputs that wellbeing, investing in wellbeing has on business outcomes. So, you know, when organizations do invest in proper wellbeing related strategies, they do see an improvement in productivity. They see a reduction in absenteeism. They see uh, an improved staff morale. All of these things will have an impact on the bottom line. So I think it's really important now that you know those that are attending these types of webinars are spreading the message of the value to business outcomes on investing in wellbeing strategy. I think it's also quite important as well that 
HSC, you know, recently have released their tenure strategy, one of which, you know, one of the key points of their tenure strategy is to address the causes of stress within the workplace. Um, and of course, they, pro they produce guidance on how to assess the risk of stress within an organization but then also what to do about the, the causes of stress within an organization. So there are tools and, and services that are available to us um, in, in order to you know, see an improvement in those numbers. Excellent, thanks, Marcus. Um, I'll just answer a question that's been asked by numerous um, participants. Um, will the slides be available? Yes, they will, and we'll be sending them out post-event. So I um, hope that uh, um, answers that question. Um, now we have one from Deborah Saville, um, who says, we have a lot of our well-being support and guidance on our intranet, but this isn't very accessible to our frontline staff who work away from the office, who only have access to smaller mobile devices and are more hands-on workers with less interest in digital engagement. Do you have any tips on how to positively engage with and support these workers? Yeah, I think... Um... This um, is um, a very popular topic in HR now. How do we support remote workers, especially with um, you know the growth of the gig economy, and with a lot of our employees never coming to office? You know how how do you kind of involve them in the policies and practices in HR that you have to support them? Um, and um, I would say if if the budget allows, have have a um, um, workshop day or a conference or a seminar where you bring everyone together in one place um, and uh, involve them in, um, you know, the support that's there for them. Uh, and if it cannot be organized in one location, you could have uh, well-being champions do it in different locations uh, where your business is located. Uh, because um, I think um, one of the big, biggest uh, criticisms of uh, how uh, the gig workers are managed is that they have no interaction with uh, the people who are actually setting these policies and strategies. And uh, that's why you need like a, a kind of a world cafe day where everyone comes together and understands what the organization is doing for the well-being of staff, no matter um what kind of contract and how or how they're working or no matter which part of the world they're in or whether they're gig workers or they're uh, part-time workers or full-time staff organizations do have a responsibility of looking after their well-being and um yeah so i think a kind of a world cafe day where you bring everyone together and share what you have to say but also hear from them what would improve um you know their well-being is essential then I'll just, I'll just add in a thought on this as well, that I um, couldn't agree more with Rupa there. Um, I think that's a great idea. Um, and further to that, you know, one of the things that Gallup uh, released in their research last year was they showed that the frequency of contact between a line manager and an employee had a direct impact on the percentage of engagement from those employees. And so um, if, of course, an intranet page can be a fantastic tool for communicating because it is point of need access, 24 hours a day, anybody can go onto the internet page at any point and see the information and it's consistent for all. Um, but you can also have regular contact with a line manager, um, which you know a line manager can then produce the high level points that might be being put onto the internet page. And in Gallup's research, what they found was that regardless of whether or not a team was based in a location and seeing their line manager on a, on a, a day to day basis, face to face, or if they were working remotely over 80% of their working week, if the line manager was having regular touch points with the employee throughout the week, so up to three touch points within a week, their percentage of engagement was the same whether they were a remote worker or a worker based face-to-face uh, -face with the line manager. So if the internet page is something that isn't working for those workers that are more um, you know, out on the front line, to, so to speak, and not sat in front of a computer, uh, then the line manager can, be, can potentially become a source of communication, which really there should be anyway, but uh, that would actually help to address two issues there. Excellent. Um, here, here's a question that is actually being addressed in the, in the mainstream media, but um, I'll, I'll ask it um, to, to you, Rupa, um, from Kate Martin. Do you think that hybrid stroke remote working is actually the issue? 
that people were better off when they were mostly at the office? Or is it more about achieving hybrid solutions and shifting to the new reality? Well, uh, research has actually proved that uh, remote and hybrid work uh, has improved productivity in most cases. So um, I think remote and hybrid work is good. It's good for employees because employees are saying they have, uh, they save on the commute and they have more time uh, in the day to do things that would interest them. But provided, of course, um, I see where this question is coming from, provided that it's not eating into their personal time. Uh, and that's, that balance is really important. So I would say remote and hybrid work is good. It's a uh, year to stay. It benefits uh, employees um, is what the general consensus is. Employers are still mixed in their reaction because a lot of employers are not very convinced at the uh, productivity. So employers are yet to be convinced of the benefits of uh, remote and hybrid work, but I think we are getting there. And I think what is uh, required is uh, what you said correctly, is we need the mechanisms to get the balance and the support right. So if we get those support mechanisms in place and if we get structures in place. And um, it's with this uh, in mind that I am wishing to propose through my research a framework for hybrid and remote work. Um, so engagement and well-being um, can thrive in remote and hybrid work. And that is the focus of uh, the research. So hopefully, um, uh, when when my research is done, I would be able to share a framework for uh, practice that would help uh, this balance me mechanism to be put in place. Thanks, Rupert. Here's a big question from uh, from John Smale. He asks, who is best to complete a stress risk assessment? And is it best to do it for each individual or for, for example, a site or a department? Right. Uh, this one too, I'll pass on to Marcus. Uh, uh, you know, uh, with with stress assessments, because um, I'm not uh, very much involved on that side of the well-being strategy. Yeah. So um, that's a great question. Uh, we we've actually got some uh, training that we deliver to organisations specifically around uh, the stress risk assessment process and managing stress within organisations. So if, if that is a, a specific thing that you know anybody is uh, looking for support in, um, then feel free to to get in touch with us. We can put you in direct contact with uh, you know the necessary people to have that conversation. Um, but also just to actually answer the question, um, stress risk assessments really should be uh, unique to the way that an organisation operates, and they shouldn't necessarily follow a set structure um, that is applied to every organisation. Um, However, generally speaking, what we would recommend is that a stress risk assessment ideally should be completed with a department as opposed to just individuals. Um, however, if there is a change in circumstance for an individual that could result in a significant increase in stress, then that's when individual stress risk assessments should be taking place. Um, and then wherever possible, all of the outputs of a stress risk assessment that's completed across an organization should then feed into a, a larger uh, organizational plan um, rather than it just being led, left to departments to kind of figure it out for themselves. Um, what you tend to find is that the, the reasons for stress within an organization will be fairly consistent across the organization. Um, you will have some, you know, unique departmental uh, specific issues, but generally speaking, if an organization approaches it as a whole, then they're going to have a more of a positive uh, stress risk assessment plan uh, afterwards. And to be honest, I, I would say that doing a stress risk assessment, whilst it is, of course, really important because it can help you to identify the causes of stress, probably the most important thing is then the action plan that is written as a result of doing the stress risk assessment and then the commitment to that action plan rather than just ticking the box uh, like you might normally do with any other form of uh, risk assessment. It is something that requires a specific action plan with commitment from the organisation. Can I also add to that, um, uh, Marcus? Uh, so if a risk assessment is done for a specific individual and if there are concerns, they could be recommended to an occupational health specialist. Uh, am I right saying that? Well, 
Uh, yeah, so, and, you know, the outputs of the individual stress risk assessment potentially could point them towards benefits or, you know, support is that's available to them as an employee of that organisation. Um, mm -hmm. Or it could actually identify that there's an issue with the job design itself that is causing the stress. And therefore, if they were to be pointed in the direction of an occupational health specialist, that occupational health specialist may not actually be able to change the design of the job um, that is the actual cause of the stressor. So that, for me, is where stress assessments come into their own, because it can actually help to identify the cause of the stress rather than the person experiencing stress as a symptom of something related to their work design. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say, of course, it could depend, but it, it potentially could point them in the direction of a well-being support that's available to them. Great. Thanks, Marcus. I'm conscious of time. Um, we have four minutes remaining. Um, just to let everybody know who has asked questions that haven't been answered, we'd be happy to have you follow up with us and we can... Um, uh, let's, let's make this our last question then. Uh, this is from Catherine Brewster, um, who asks, myself and our HR department have been tasked with reviewing and updating our health safe, safe, safety and wellbeing strategy. Where would you suggest we begin and which would be most beneficial? Shall I, uh, shall I yeah. take us in, Rupa? Yeah. Yes, yeah, I think that. Yeah, great. So um, firstly, fantastic. Good to hear that that's something that you're going to the review, review process of. Um, I think there are you know, many an organization out there that will have a health, safety and wellbeing strategy in place and consider that to be job done. Um, but ultimately, iteration is the most important thing of any kind of health, safety and well-being strategy. Um, and the point in which, you know, where to start, how, you know, how do you know where to begin the process? Um, ultimately, that depends on what the, the point of the health, safety and well-being strategy is. You know, what is the overall mission statement of that health, safety and well-being strategy? And is that being achieved in what's currently included in the strategy? Um, and if, if the answer to that question is, well, we don't know what the overall mission statement is, um, or we do know what the mission statement is, but we have no idea whether or not we're achieving our mission statement, then the, the kind of answers to those questions starts to point you in the direction of where you need to start. Um, but of course, you know, the Being Well Together program has, has been designed in order to be a reference point as to how you need to review where you're currently at and then what you need to do is your next point of call in order to determine what your priorities are. Um, so of course, Being Well Together pro program could potentially be a, a solution there. But I think outside of that, if you just understand whether or not you're achieving your mission statement, um, that can then point you in the direction of where you need to start. Great stuff. Thanks. Thanks, Marcus. Um, I think that brings us to the end. We're, we're out of time. What a great session we've had with masses of questions. Thank you all for, um, for participating with your questions and, and for tuning. I'd like to thank specifically. Um, for this uh, excellent presentation, and I hope this is the, the first of many. Um, also, thank you for your expert um, counsel and advice. And um, we look forward to welcoming you to the next, the third um, webinar program. Post webinar, um, we really so. Um,